Testing, testing. There we go. Sorry about that. What's up, everybody? Welcome to the live stream. Thank you for stopping by. By the way, I have some new stream settings that I'm testing out which with the connection and stuff like that. And so just in the chat, if, if it's smooth and good, let me know if you're having issues, if it's buffering, let me know if it's dropping. Let's just check here. We're all live on Facebook. Okay, good. I think we had a little bit of a hiccup on YouTube because I lost, it looks like I lost people and then everybody came back. Are we good? Everything's smooth. Okay. Try that. Okay. Is it better? Um, I changed the settings back. I think. Let's make sure I have a little bit of rough start here. Okay. All right. Are we good? All right. I'm not gonna mess with that again. I have this tendency to like try to up like tweak stuff that's already working and then I make it worse. So let me just leave it alone. Uh, let me make sure we're back on Facebook and YouTube. So we're going to be talking about the Singh family. Sorry about the issues. We're back on line. Oh no. What happened? Shit. Okay. Are we good or not? Nah? Oh my God. Don't say the Lord's name in vain. I'm unsubscribing. All right. Are we good? All right. If it buffers again, I'm going to end the stream and we'll just start over. Oh, wow. Nothing's working on my computer. What the hell happened? <laughs> there we go. Good. Okay. We're good. Don't touch anything. Don't press any buttons. All right. All right. Rough Sunday. All right. When I uh when we get to some of the audio the video clips, I'll fix the Twitch and Facebook. But all right, let's start with the Singh family. Sorry about all the connect the issues this morning. I won't I won't mess with the settings again. Screw that. I'm just gonna whatever works, I'm just leaving it. I'm not gonna try to improve the quality and everything else. Um so let's start with uh, Jesus Salgado, the brother brother of Alberto arrested after California family kidnap. And we're going to talk a little bit about too, because, you know, when we saw that family clip of, uh, let me make sure we're good. Is it buffering again? Okay. I'm about to say, um, when we saw that family clip of, I think the cousins talking, the cousins had said that I think the wife or somebody had looked at the surveillance video and that they did not recognize this guy, the, uh, Jesus. But well, this is Alberto, whatever his name is. They didn't recognize Jesus. And so they were like, he did not work for the family. And <laughs> stay still. He did not work for the family. They were saying he didn't work for the family. They didn't recognize him. But then it's come out that he did at one point work for the family. And not only that, but that supposedly he had sent texts and emails. This guy was like a lunatic. And remember, he had the, the, the past victim family as well that he had harassed and held him up at gunpoint and all sort of stuff too. So why did that happen? Why did the family say they didn't recognize this guy? I have a couple of theories why. I mean, my first one, which we're going to get to in a bit, maybe because this guy was wearing a mask. Maybe. You know, I don't know. Uh, his face was covered. I mean, I, but I, I guess they didn't recognize his voice because they welcomed him in. Maybe he was pretending to be, I don't know. So let's see. Let's see here. The brother of pure evil Jesus Salgado charged with four counts of kidnap and murder for allegedly wiping out his former boss's family has been arrested as a suspected accomplice. Alberto Salgado was arrested Thursday night by the Mercer County, California Sheriff's Office in connection with to the killing. And that's the other thing, too. I was wondering, like, what exactly was this guy's. Uh, the brother, what exactly did he help to do in this? says he is believed to have assisted his brother in the gruesome kidnapping and deaths of these four people we've been talking about. And Alberto has been arrested and charged with criminal conspiracy accessory and destroying evidence. What evidence did he destroy? Was that the vehicle? Did he burn the vehicle? Conspiracy and accessory. Was he the one? Because remember that, that six minute time gap where Alberto, not Alberto, Jesus takes the father, the uncle, 
and takes him off for six minutes and goes somewhere and comes right back, which was like really short. Was he meeting up with the brother? Was there a drop off point? What was up with that? And when he left them, was the brother watching them? I don't know. Jesus Salgado worked for the family's trucking business, Unison Inc. And so remember this whole Unison thing was like the mystery address thing we we're trying to figure out because this is what the articles were saying, but the new business was located somewhere else. And so what happened was this Jesus guy, he had worked for the family. I thought they said like a year or two ago. So I guess a year or two ago, this was the location where Jesus was at working, I guess. But the relationship turned into a nasty dispute over text messages or emails, sparking a long year, a year long feud, Merced County Sheriff said. So, I mean, I don't know. I would, I mean, if I had this kind of issue with somebody in my in like place of employment or, play, or an employee with an employee, this would be the first person that pops up in my head, though. That's crazy, motherfucker. They probably didn't know his history, I'm sure. But uh, all these text messages and emails. And the fact that this guy waited so long to come and kill these, these people, too. Grumpy email. I sent you a DM on Twitter, a comment on the tweet Mercer County put out when he was arrested. I identified him as a truck driver days ago. Let me see. You just sent that now? Take a quick look. I don't know when you sent that. I have a lot of DMs. If you sent it recently, I can see it at the top. Um, surveillance video shows Jesus leading the seeing brothers who had their hands zip tied behind their backs into the back of Amin Deep's pickup truck. There's the brother here. I mean, I don't know. How do you conspire? Like, this is your brother and you're just like, yeah, I'm going to help you out. So what is you're just being a brother and helping him out? You, you couldn't talk sense into him? You thought this was a good idea too? Because I was thinking like maybe this guy has some sort of mental illness or whatever. Some people are just evil. And this guy, I guess Alberto, thought it was a good idea too to do this to the family and a baby. An eight month old baby. Over being fired. Or whatever. Let go of whatever the situation was. He then returned and forced Jocelyn with her baby in arms from the business into the truck and again drove off. Hours later, the same truck was found on fire in a nearby town. The family's bodies were found on Thursday. Local authorities called Jesus alleged acts pure evil. He had previously served eight years. We're going to talk a little bit more about that. Where he threatened the family. We're actually going to rewatch the clip. And a lot of people were saying this too. I mean, I don't, shit, I don't know what I would do or what anybody would do. You have a gun to to your head, to your face, your family's there, your, your, your baby's there. I couldn't imagine if it was my daughter, like what exactly what I would do. Some people say, I don't know what it is because there, there is like these online, like YouTube channels, like these, I don't know if it's, I forgot that these safety channels. I, I thought some of them say you should fight back. I mean, or, or should you comply? Or when it comes to getting in, into a vehicle, or it depends where you're at. Maybe you're in a parking lot, a parking lot, maybe you should scream and fight. I don't know how desolate this place is. It's really hard to say what anybody would do, you know, and I just can't, you know. Friend says, never let yourself get put into a vehicle, fight and fight and make as much noise as possible. Things go badly, but once you're in, once you're in there, all options are gone bad. I mean, hindsight is always twenty twenty. Hindsight is always twenty twenty. Um, but I mean, if, if they had fought back there, it would have been more maybe open and shut. But yeah, I mean, I don't know. It's not even really fair to do that. I think like trying to, I don't know. What would you do? It's hard to say. What would anybody do? Um, I wanted to play just a small portion of this where the family was interviewed. And if you guys could hit like on the stream, I'd really appreciate that. Helps out with the algorithm. Sorry again for all the issues we had this morning. Um, let me play this clip here and from friends through, you know, family members, the connection there. So it seems like, you know, the pictures have already been released by the sheriff's office. Our cousins went into work this uh, or yesterday morning. Um, they have a trucking business. So at some point it seems like there was somebody outside that 
you know, was picking up trash possibly, that person was let into the business to possibly give them more trash to take with them if he was recycling and offered like beverages, like, hey, you're here. Why don't we give you juice to make you whole? And it seems like at some point that whole encounter like turned into a kidnapping. It's somebody that none of the family knows. And we've all reviewed, you know, the pictures from that video surveillance that the SO shared already. So you don't think that they, they had any idea who this, who this guy was? No, because no, we don't. the cousin, like there's one of our cousins that was there without his wife, without his child, like his wife is with us and she's reviewed that video surveillance to see if it was maybe an employee that worked there, a former employee, um, or just somebody that they have maybe an acquaintance with and she has not recognized him. She's never seen him before. Now you said they, they have a truck, trucking company. Did they... Did he uh, kidnap him and, and make him drive in a in a truck or anything like that? Their car? Any? We don't have any vehicle description, like you know how they got. It. I just want to play that part. The only thing I can think is that you know maybe they didn't they didn't recognize this guy because of the mask. I guess you know I don't know. Maybe he was trying to be. Hey, down the rabbit hole news. How you doing? Welcome. Appreciate you being here. Yesterday evening, the Mercer County Sheriff's Office, with the assistance of the California Department, arrested and booked Alberto Salgado. Um, he's the brother of Jesus and charged, charged with uh, or arrested for conspiracy, accessory, and destroyed evidence. Um, and so this is a little bit more of the details, too, where we, which we've kind of covered all this, but the bodies were found Wednesday evening, just three days after they were kidnapped. Uh, the sheriff office received a call around 5 30 PM from a nearby farmer of the bodies of bodies found relatively close to each other near Indiana and Hutchinson's roads near the Dos Palos. It's described as extremely rural and remote farmland located 27 miles South of Merced. Um, so they didn't talk about the discussion, uh, the conditions of the body. But what I, what I had heard, because it says here, it says it was unclear how the baby died. Uh, Warnke said the child has had no visible trauma and an autopsy would be conducted. What I had heard that they believe, I read somewhere, a friend sent me something, an article. I think that he, had, he didn't actually like shoot the baby. I think he, I, from what I read somewhere, I was told he had just left the baby out there in the sun, just in the, in the condition, just left the baby out there to die. I think the sheriff had said that, I don't know. So he just left the baby to die. I think we did talk about that in one of the previous streams. Tonight with the search for answers in the kidnapping and murder of a Merced family and their Exposure, eight month old right? baby. Yeah. It has become a family's worst nightmare in Merced. The bodies of four family members, including an infant, were all found dead last night in a rural area. ABC 10's Kurt Rivera is live in Merced right now with more on this tragic end. Kurt. Well, Laura, obviously the family and law enforcement had hoped that the family would be found safe and sound. Unfortunately, that was not the case. The motive of this case appears to be a disagreement over money and the suspect confirmed to be a former employee. Missing since Monday, an eight month old, her father, mother and uncle from their trucking business just outside Merced. The suspect caught on video kidnapping the family in their own vehicle. The horrifying end coming Wednesday night around 530. It was here in a very remote location of Merced County near Dos Palos, about 30 minutes away from the family's trucking company where the bodies of the family were found. It was a farm. Is that, was it a dispute over unpaid wages? A worker who found the bodies too. deep in this almond orchard. The bodies were found relatively close together. What this person did was affected our world. You know, this incident, four people dead because of his evil behavior. According to our ABC Fresno affiliate, a spokesperson for the family says the suspect, Jesus Manuel Delgado, was a former employee of the family's trucking business and had a disagreement over money. I believe disagreement over money. Uh, because of this guy's yeah. history, he's had a history of uh, doing things before uh, like this uh, pertaining to money he figured was owed to him. We feel that this is probably the same thing. At the family's unison trucking on Highway 59, a bouquet of flowers sits at the entrance and another bouquet on the fence. 
Blas Pen. Not, not like family. family, not like boss. It's like friend. They have a great heart. Very, very nice, very uh, nice people. In the family's neighborhood, disbelief and shock that the family won't be coming home. It's very tragic. It's, it's a shame to see something like that in Merced. This neighbor knew the family in passing, but preferred to remain anonymous. And the baby was a... Kim said that they told her in a self-defense class, the fight, are going to do it either way, no matter what they tell you, fight. Very sweet baby. Um, I had a few encounters, like, you know, of, uh, just seeing her face and kind of saying hi to the baby. Um, very, very sad news. Hey, Lavada, how you doing, man? And that suspect, Jesus Salgado, remains hospitalized after attempting to commit suicide. And the sheriff says, and he believes, that there is an accomplice in this case and says if he or she is watching, turn yourself in. This was before the, the brother was arrested. And you remember at that press conference, too, he had said that he believes there's somebody else. The killings of a Merced family of four. The arrest was announced this morning by the Merced County Sheriff's Office. ABC 10's Kurt Rivera explains the suspect's connection to the family. In custody in the Merced County Jail, Alberto Salgado. He was arrested for criminal conspiracy, accessory, and destroying evidence. He's the brother of Jesus Manuel Salgado. Jesus Salgado booked Thursday night and arrested for four counts of murder and four counts of kidnapping. We know what we know. We know he did it, but now we got to convince 12 people that he did it. Sheriff Byrne Warnke believes money is the motive in the case, telling the Associated Press Salgado had a feud with the family and their trucking business. Salgado is a former employee who, according to the sheriff, quote, got pretty nasty in text messages or emails with the Singh family dating back a year. It could have been anywhere from the uh, money being owed to uh, disrespect. There's something along those lines to have that motivation to come in here. The sheriff says it. I wonder if they'll ever release those, or maybe during a trial or something they'd release it. In 2005, sure. Salgado had a similar beef with another former boss. According to the California Department of Corrections, he was convicted on first-degree robbery with a firearm, false imprisonment, and more. He was sentenced to 11 years. He was released on parole in 2015 and discharged from parole in 2018. He also received an eight-month sentence from Merced County for possession of a controlled substance. I th fully think that it's because of our lack of teeth in a judicial system that we have in this state that we're, uh, they're allowing the, the criminals to be more brazen. And That's what it is, too, isn't it, with California? These people, I'm surprised anybody really does time over there. You really got to, like, kill somebody. And even then, do they even, uh, this person really shouldn't have been out, probably, right? I forgot. According to the California Department of Corrections, he was convicted on first-degree robbery with a firearm, robbery. false imprisonment, and more. He was sentenced to 11 years. Oh, 11 he was years. released on parole in 2015 and discharged from parole in 2018. Damn. He also received an eight-month sentence from Merced County for possession of a controlled substance. I th fully think that it's because of our lack of teeth in a judicial system that we have in this state that we're, uh, they're allowing the, the criminals to be more brazen and... And they're running free. Obviously more They're running free over there in Cali. And they're getting away with it. Do whatever you want over there. That was our Kurt Rivera reporting. The Merced County District Attorney's Office is still waiting to receive the case from sheriff's investigators. Ugh. There was this uh, People article, too, that just kind of reiterated... Um, former employee with the family business who was in a pro protracted argument with them that had turned deadly. I had a falling out, got pretty nasty after he left the company more than a year ago. After about a year ago, after Salgado parted ways with the company, he sent emails and text messages to the family expressing anger over an apparent disagreement they had had. The family's relatives told investigators the sheriff did not provide further details. Um, the only thing I can think of was did it I mean I don't know this guy looks kind of distinct I mean did they not recognize him or did they recognize him and just trying to be nice and stuff did he come up I mean I wonder what it, what his words were what, what did he say you know was there you know according to what I've heard, they said the Sikh people are really nice. And you see the, the 
current employee saying that uh, they're just really nice people. They don't even teach, treat he said they don't treat him like a, like they're the boss. They treat him like a friend. You know, like just very nice people. Um, they do have I'm going to share this story again real quick. The former victim and then we're going to look at the GoFundMe. And then we're going to talk a little bit about Stockton. Uh, oh yeah. I don't think it plays on this. Oh, it does. Investigates disturbing details regarding the past of the man suspected they did of remember? kidnapping okay. that family. And this morning, the sheriff said during that press conference that 48-year-old Jesus Salgado had a criminal past, including a robbery from 2005 that led to an eight-year prison sentence. Investigative reporter Medeiros Babb joining us now live in studio. Medeiros, you actually talked with a man who says that he was the victim of that 2005 robbery. He says Salgado held him, his wife, and two 16-year-old girls at gunpoint. That's right, Brian. And the victim did not want to be filmed on camera. He also did not want to be identified in any way. But he says that Salgado, quote, has no soul and described the terrifying moments. The man says Salgado showed up to his home in a mask with a gun. Just a day after Merced Sheriff officials arrested 48-year-old Jesus Manuel Salgado, documents revealing his shocking criminal past. According to court papers in 2007, Salgado pleaded no contest to first-degree robbery, attempted false imprisonment, and dissuading a witness, and was sentenced to 11 years in prison. Our station began investigating, went to the home that was the scene of the 2005 robbery, and managed to find the man who says he and his family <coughs> were victimized. We Somebody said you couldn't pay Ruth on Facebook said you couldn't pay me to live in uh, California. <laughs> I kind of like it. I mean, the times I've been there to visit, I don't know that I could live there though. I don't know about that either. It's, it's really expensive. On the phone because he's still afraid in any way to be associated with what happened 17 years ago. The man who owned a Central Valley trucking company says Salgado worked for him for two years. After firing Salgado, the man says the suspect showed up to his home in a ski mask one December night. The man said over the phone, quote, I went to shut the front door when he pulled out a gun and held it to the back of my head, end quote. The homeowner says Salgado duct taped the hands of himself, his wife, their 16-year-old daughter, along with his daughter's friend. According to the man, Salgado then reportedly, quote, stole all the money we had, rings, that kind of stuff. The man says Salgado even took the ring off his wife's finger before he, quote, made the girls jump into the pool, and he tried to push me into the pool. I was able to jump into the shallow end instead of... And my friend, because I was asking him, I was asking my friend about why I have them go into the pool. And she was telling me maybe so, I don't know, so they could drown or have a hard time getting out if their hands are tied, you know? The deep end, end quote. Once in the pool, the man says Selgato told them, quote, if you call the police, I, I will know. kill you, end or quote. Or just have a hard time getting out, maybe? The man says Selgato then walked out the front door. Now, the man that I spoke with says they did call police and they say that Selgato... Yeah, yeah, he made him jump in the pool with his hands duct taped. I was wondering, like, well, I don't understand what's the point of that, but maybe so they either have a hard time getting out or so they drown or something. Uh, uh. was arrested that next morning, according to the California Department of Corrections. Salgado spent eight years in prison and then served three years on. Yeah, hard to tread water with hands tied. Yeah, oof. probation. It's pretty I sick. I gotta know, you know, how is this gentleman feeling? Know that he and his family survived this nightmare, and that another family is going through this nightmare right now. And that's something that I did ask him. Now, he's obviously reliving this moment, him and his family. That's got to be crazy, too. Yeah, thinking that could have been you guys, you know, previously. He said that when he initially saw the photos and then heard the name, he realized that it was the same man. But he was just shocked to hear what happened, especially to another family just like his own. And how's, how's that first family doing after such a traumatic event? What's the impact been on them? One of the things... He should have been charged with attempted murder. I think so too, yeah. That he said, and I can relate to this because I'm such a father's daughter. He said, it wasn't about yeah. me, it was about my daughter. And from that moment on, it just affected that 16 year old's life forever. She also had a friend there. Yeah. And the man that I spoke with just said, it was so heartbreaking to be a father and have to watch your daughter go through something like that. But it is really, really chilling. And great work digging through all of this to be able yeah. to get that for us. So they, they do have a GoFundMe. Uh, 
Oh, this is the Deary family. This is kind of mixed. I've been calling them the Singh family, but uh, and this thing has been jumping. This go for me. Every time I like I refresh, it's like up a couple thousand. Uh, and so I figured, let me just read some of the details on here. I put the link in the description if you do want to donate. They got a lot of support, I guess, from the community and everybody. It says this story of our shared American dream gone wrong. Our loving family was finally taken away from us October 3rd. Criminal kidnapped and murdered our beautiful eight month old baby, Arui. And I'm sorry if I mispronounced this stuff. I can't read anyway, but yeah, sorry about that. Her mother, Jesseline, her father, Jess Deep, and her uncle, Amin Deep. As immigrants to America, they worked tirelessly, tirelessly for 18 years to achieve safety, security, and community for themselves and their families. Amin Deep and Jess Deep were the primary bread earners for the family, supported their el elderly parents, and lived under one roof. Those who left behind, they are survived by Aruhi's grandparents, Randir Singh and Kirpal, Aman's wife, Jaspreet, yeah, Aman's wife, Jaspreet Kar, their children, Ikam and si Sirat, uh, six years old and nine years old. Randir and Kirpal were overjoyed in the recent years to see their family grow. They were proud to see their sons, Amandeep and Jazdeep, and Cherish playing with their granddaughter, Arui. They recently traveled to India to plan a lorry celebrating Arui's fam uh, sorry, arrival in the family and not miss her greatly. They're left with a void in their family and cannot be filled. Jazz is now a single mother taking care of two bright children who are left without their father and cannot fathom why their dad did not return. Who were Arui, Jasleen, Jess Deep, and Aman? Arui loved to run around the house in her walker and was a joyous child. She loved being held in her grandparents' aunts and uncles' arms. Her eyes were always full of joy. She meant the world to her little cousins, Ikam and Sirat. Arui's parents, Jess Deep and Jasleen, were married three years ago in India and reunited two years ago in America after Jasleen's immigration. They were barely starting to make memories together as a family with their baby. And keeping with it, his name, Amin, meaning peace, was calm, positive, charitable, and always ready to help others. Amin was the rock of his family, a great dad who always made time to cuddle with his son, Ikam, uh, read with his daughter, Sirat, and treasure their many art projects and other accomplishments. Amin was loved and admired by his wife, Jazz. Amin routinely donated food to the local food bank and found comfort in his faith, never missing Sunday service in the temple, he was a caring elder brother and a role model to his cousins. What are we asking for? And they really have some beautiful pictures here too. I mean, I, I like the GoFundMe because it gives a little bit like the details because it gives some information about the family, a little bit of the back history um, and the makeup of the family. And I didn't know that meant peace. Amen means peace. So what they're asking for, we're grateful for the prayers and tremendous support was shown to us by our community. While nothing can fill this void, your prayers and donations will support the upbringing and education of Ikam and Sirat and provide financial relief to Jazz, Randir, and Kripal in these difficult times. There's some pictures there. That's the dad. That's mom and baby. Dad and baby. This looks like the, I guess, the uncle and his wife. Oh. His kids. So that's the page there. nice pictures of the family um there was some news clips i don't know where it's at i don't have it now but well, that, i was looking into that for a potential stream there was some news clips too where i saw the family had, had was, was speaking a bit too i don't know where i must have lost i'm not sure where it's at but yeah they're saying this guy had previously worked for them and um i guess they had a grudge now, with the Stockton serial killer, okay, 
most sites are saying that there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven victims, one survivor. So six murdered, one survivor. There's one website, one YouTube link that says 12. I don't know where they got that from. It says 12. I'd have to side with most of what all the articles are saying until something else updates. Um, the first victim. So that we know of, who knows who really the first victim is, but the first victim, my nose is kind of stuffed. Sorry. I feel like I'm might be getting something. So. Uh, was in Oakland. Okay. There's the guy. I'll pull up his name in a second. He was shot and killed in Oakland. His family had just spoken up recently, like yesterday, I think. So we're going to watch some of that. Um, they speak up and then the the survivor we saw the survivor was here in uh, North Union Street and Park right by the train track she was shot by the train by the train tracks somewhere the train station uh, so we're gonna see now oops some of the family from this first person sister of Oakland homicide victim tied to Stockton serial killing speaks out. An Oakland family is searching for answers tonight in the murder of their loved one. Juan Vasquez Serrato was killed in East Oakland, <laughs> the first victim of an apparent serial killer who is still on the loose. Our crime reporter Henry Lee is joining us now live from the newsroom after speaking with the victim's sister. Henry. Well, Alex, she and her family were already suffering from the loss of their loved one, but now hearing he was apparently targeted by a serial killer, their pain is even deeper than before. This is Juan Vasquez Serrano, who was shot and killed in East Oakland last year, but he's the first known victim of an apparent serial killer who's on the loose after fatally shooting five other people in Stockton in recent months. Whoever did it doesn't know how painful this is and how painful this is for my mom. Maria Vasquez is Serrano's sister. Through an interpreter, she told me she... And the demographics out there, by the way, let me just double check it again. The demographics are Stockton. I think it's majority Hispanic. Stockton. But let me double check that. One second. I thought I saw somebody on Twitter post that thing from True Crime Replay. Demographics. So... White, Asian. I don't know why this website doesn't have it. Or Hispanic. Well, this website's doing it kind of weird. I'll have to find somewhere where somebody in the chat knows where I can look. Because this one's not saying Hispanic. Wikipedia. Shit, it depends where you go. It's like 46% coastal butterfly says 46% Hispanic, 30% white, 15% African American. Okay. Because I, and the reason I say that is because they were wondering, is this targeted towards Hispanic or is it just that there's a bunch of Hispanic people there? Um, I don't know. She's sad and scared. She's very uh, afraid of uh, someone just killing random people out there. Stockton police say a suspected serial killer is linked to Vasquez's shooting death near 57th and Harmon in East Oakland on April 10th, 2021. A person of interest is seen here on surveillance footage. Police say someone shot and killed five other victims in the Stockton area from July to September of this year. All the victims were ambushed while alone in the dark. Vasquez leaves behind three daughters, now seven. Vasquez says no family members have ever spent time in Stockton, nor do they recognize the man seen in the video. She says she had one question for the elusive killer. Why are you doing this to innocent people? But she's hopeful that with all the news coverage that the killer will be arrested. She know that it's it's coming. Justice is coming. Now, anyone with information on Juan Vasquez Serrano's killing is asked to call Oakland police. Juan Vasquez Serrano. So now we have his identity. Um, because I don't think I don't think they Yeah, they did he wasn't identified before, I don't think. Now now the Oh it is. 
affiliate KTV reported that the coroner identified the man as Juan Miguel Vasquez Serrano. Okay. Uh, there was another article. Put it on the big screen. Leaves behind three daughters. So there's another one too. The Oakland man identified as one of the victims of a suspected serial killer from Stockton. Yeah, big development. Crown Forest Dan Thorne talked with Vasquez's daughter. And I bet these people probably like, like the victims and stuff. These people that are shot and killed, they probably never got the time, the day, like the light at all, like any kind of attention on their story. I probably it's probably just a if it, if it even made the news, probably just a blip, if anything. You know, these people, these families, victims, they've probably never been heard from before from the public. Nobody probably really gave much attention or cared. And now that it's being linked to a, a serial killing, they have an opportunity to kind of speak up and also kind of highlight the life of the person that was taken away from them. Daughter and sister who are still seeking justice, Dan. Well, Grant and Vicky, obviously the family heartbroken by this development. Vasquez is believed to be the first victim of this suspected serial killer who is still on the loose tonight. <laughs> the family of Miguel Vasquez holding back tears. Investigators say the 39-year-old father of three was killed in East Oakland in April 2021. He is one of six men believed to be connected to a suspected serial killer. Why did he do this to my dad without knowing uh, who he uh, is, like, daughter. leaving his daughter's behind? <laughs> Inez Vazquez is Miguel's <laughs> oldest daughter. She says his death has been painful for their family. He was a really, a really great father. He was well known in Oakland. He was well known. He was kind. He was hard worker. Stockton's police chief says ballistics evidence linked Vazquez to several other victims in Stockton. The chief released this video of someone they're calling a person of interest. Vasquez had been living on the streets in Oakland and worked odd jobs. Vasquez's sister is scared that her brother's killer is still out there. He's heartless and he's killing innocent people without caring that they have children or families. Oakland and Stockton police are working together to find the killer. We just want justice for the families out there and for my dad too. Investigators say the victims' ages range from 21 to 54 years old. Most of them were Hispanic men from Stockton. A $125,000 reward. I really, I, I was trying to find the other day that community meeting that they had because I wanted to see the chief speak. I still haven't found it. I was searching around. It's got to be online somewhere, but I haven't been able to find it. Uh... As a series of killings remain under investigation in Stockton, Hispanic and Latino residents. I'm kind of scared at times. And business owners. I, I wonder what it's like for the people out there. Like, it's got to be everybody's on high alert. Uh, I'm going to show you a clip soon, too, of like the homeless people. They're on high alert, too. There was some lady talking about bring it. Like, we're waiting for you. And, and I was talking to, to Silvio, too. And uh, I think yesterday I was talking to him. And we're, I was saying, like, at, and we're going to see something too that it has to be, I'm thinking it has to be somebody local, somebody that like lives there or, or was raised there. It's somebody probably in that community. Um, and then I was telling him too, I was like, Yo, if I was, if I was this guy, I'd probably change my ML. Like if I was, then I know they're onto me. I'd probably get a different gun, maybe change locations. But then the problem with changing locations is that maybe you don't know the area as well. You know, maybe you're more likely to get caught. Maybe you don't, you know, maybe there's more cameras in another place. You know, I, I'm thinking this guy's got to be seeing all this news and he's he's either going to like take a break, slow down, or if he can't stop himself, maybe try to change locations, change guns. 
owners. La policía ponga más, más cartas en el asunto. Y... Are asking police to increase their presence to ensure safety throughout the city. 35, 30. Margarita Flores is a business owner in North Stockton. And after 24 years in business, Lo estoy vendiendo. she's selling her Mexican restaurant because she's tired of the crime in the city. I, I do get concerned because I, I have a, a kid of my own. And... and she's not the only one. I'm always pretty much looking for my surroundings. Make sure everything's clear. Alejandro Magallón Vargas not only worries for his safety when he's out of work late. I'm very scared. Every every uh, night when, when I go to sleep, I always think like, man, uh, I hope to see my mom on another day, you know, because she, she does work pretty early in the mornings. Although police haven't confirmed whether the victims have been targeted based on race or whether they're unhoused, Salvador Dubaday's daughter finds a strange connection. I mean, there's a lot more homeless people um, that are like every other. Oh, this is uh, Salvador's daughter. Oh. Skin color or race. Then a victim to why Hispanics. Her father, Salvador Dubide Jr., was one of the four unhoused victims, who she says deserved better. When he was sober, he was a good person and he was fun to be around. And he always made me feel like a princess and could have had a longer life had he received the help he needed i think that this should definitely be a wake-up call for them i mean to make more housing to to give the homeless and people with addiction a second chance this year's point in time count of homelessness in san joaquin county shows that more than 930 people who are unhoused in the county are white while 406 were either hispanic or latino in stockton maricela de la cruz kcr 3 news tom tom um mo had sent me the story you're talking about so when we're done talking about this uh, the Stockton stuff. I'm gonna take a. I'm gonna share with you guys. We'll talk about that story. We'll take a look at it together. Um. All right. So. Let's see what else I got here. Oh yeah, let me show you this too. The homeless. Everybody's on higher alert over there. We're homeless. CBS 13's Brady Halbleib is live with a growing concern from community advocates. Brady. Well, guys, people of all backgrounds is really following this case extremely close. And that also includes our homeless population here in Stockton. And I spoke to one woman today who tells me she's not afraid. If he wants to come out here, he's more than welcome. We'll be waiting for him. Nancy Veal is defiant in saying she's not afraid and she's not alone. He thinks he's going to come over here and mess with anyone of us here. I mean, he's got something else coming. Nancy lives in a small tent surrounded by many others. She says she and her neighbors are staying vigilant by traveling together in groups and keeping a close eye on each other, especially at night. All, all these people here, we all know each other. We're all friends and we treat each other like family, so we look out for each other. The homeless population isn't the only one standing defiantly. Longtime Stockton resident Jesse Gillen isn't afraid, but he remembers the Zodiac killer and understands why people are on edge. Yeah, we got the Zodiac uh, killer here in Stockton. The same thing happened back in the 60s. Unlike the Zodiac killer, police have a small piece of video surveillance of a person of interest. While the footage isn't identifiable, forensic psychologist Dr. Robert Shug says the way the suspect walks could help the community identify them. And so I think that's that's an interesting point. Like looking at that, the way he's walking and perhaps would help identify him perhaps on the street. And the Stockton Police Department is offering a $125,000 reward. They haven't given it really any updates since, really. It's been a while with the Stock, uh, Stockton serial killer. It's been kind of quiet. Six dead, one survivor, one grainy piece of surveillance footage, the trail of death left by a suspect, ugh, suspected serial killer in Stockton and Oakland has left the communities on edge. Now victims, families, and city residents are looking for answers. The Daily Beast spoke with three experts on serial killers about who the Stockton killer might be, why he is killing, and how he might be caught. All agree that the killer is likely a local or very familiar with the Stockton area, plans out his crimes, and intentionally chooses vulnerable victims. The killer is a male in his early 30s. 
uh, Yaksik predicts based on the data his group has collected on serial killers and lives in the same North Stockton neighborhood where most of his victims have been killed. He lives with close relatives who may not be aware of his activities. Damn, imagine that. This guy's living with, with relatives and shit. Probably, all right, mom, I'm going out. Let me see. Hold on. What am I? Oh. So this is the whole area here in Stockton. Besides, we got the Oakland. But they're, they're all pretty relatively close. And if you look, I mean, there's a one here. This is the first survivor. This was from uh, 2021. But if you look at the more recent killings, they're all here like in a kind of close proximity. This guys, I'm thinking, just assuming this guy's got to be in the area. Um, He may be killing out of need to appease intense feelings of anger. Killing may be the offender's way of relieving the stress and pressure he experiences in daily life. He believes the reason so many of the victims were homeless is because they were easy targets. And you guys remember too, we've spoken about it multiple times. The, um, the serial killer we had here in Miami, that guy was a real estate agent or whatever. And he was targeting homeless people. I, I'm maybe cause they're easy targets or, or maybe he didn't like homeless people. I don't know. Um, Part of the reason that many serial killers target unhoused beyond their inherent vulnerability is that they reside in an unmonitored places, oh, sorry, in unmonitored places and generally do not have devices such as cell phones that can record them. But he also said that the killer may be homeless himself. Ooh, possible. Or at least familiar with the community. Although most of the killer's victims are Latino, police have said they do not currently believe the killings are hate crimes. The shooter may be Latino himself. Imagine that as much, as the majority of serial killings are interracial. Oh. He may be nearly watching the media coverage of his crimes and enjoying being recognized for his deeds. A Sikh is confident that the killer will be caught when someone from the community comes forward with information. For the families of the victims, there are currently more questions than answers about the person who, who took the lives of their loved ones. Who does that? What kind of monster does that? Uh, the uncle of one of the victims, Salvador de Buye, Debude asked in an interview, the Daily Beast on Wednesday, Debude, known as Sal to family and friends, was shot to death in the parking lot of Popeye's August 11th while trying to buy dinner. Uh, and this is the first victim we just saw. Okay. This stuff we've covered already. Oh, but hold on. I want to get a... Uh, Okay, Renick served in the FBI for 30 years in his long career. He worked serial murder cases and specialized in cases involving children for several years. Renick worked out of the FBI field office of Sacramento for only 50 miles from Stockton. Renick says we should be careful not to make assumptions about the perpetrator and emphasize that very little information has been made public by police. However, having reviewed the case, he gave his thoughts about the killer. I believe that the offender was making an effort to ensure that he or she was alone with the victim and that the area would be safe. I believe that the offender is taking measures to lower the risk factor of crimes. He said, pointing out that this means the crimes are probably planned and not spontaneous. I was thinking probably spontaneous, but I guess not anymore. I'm thinking I mean, I'm going to lean with the experts, I guess. I guess this guy's really planning his shit. Renick said the locations and timings of his crime suggest the killer may be surveilling his victims prior to attacking them, making sure he approaches under the cover of darkness while they are isolated. The close proximity of five, the close proximity of five of the shootings clustered in North Stockton suggests to Renick that the perpetrator may know the area well. If you took all these locations and determined him the center of them, what, what would there be? He says, it's very possible the offender is living right there. Two of the shootings stand out to Renick as different from the others. The first known shooting that took place in Oakland, 70 miles away from Stockton, which is, yeah, it's weird. When Juan Miguel Vasquez Serrano was killed on April 10th, 2021, Renick said that if he was investigating the case, he would be looking closely at that killing. Yeah, it's weird. Why that one? All the way in Oakland. And then all the focus is there in Stockton. What happened? As well as the shooting of Natasha Latour, 
the killer's lone surviving victim, which again, we, we streamed the, the interview the other day, but I, I put the link. Let me see. It's in the description for 209 times. If you want to see that survivor's uh, story, if you haven't seen that yet, I also shared the video directly to my Facebook page. Um, the tour now believes the subsequent killings could have been prevented if law enforcement had taken her story seriously. She says they dismissed her because she was homeless at the time. Five people died because they didn't listen to me. The tour told a local outlet. Two or nine times. <laughs> um, all right. Uh, I just want to get to the, the next expert. Robert Shug, a forensic psychologist and a professor in criminology and forensic psychology of at California State University, Long Beach, usually encounters serial killers when he interviews them after they've committed their crimes and been caught. In this case, he's watching the case unfold in real time with a perpetrator still at large. Shug, like Rennix, believes understanding the victims is important. Serial killers kill people who are vulnerable, who they can overpower easily. Shug says, pointing out that many of the victims were homeless and all but one were male. It's unusual, he says, to see a serial killer targeting men. And the, the, the survivor, she said herself, she, she could pass for a male. So this guy probably thought he was shooting or killing a, a male. These victims may, okay, these may be victims of convenience. He said, pointing out that the killer strikes at night. Are these just people who are out and about? In a way, Shug says... It is the randomness of these killings that makes them so terrifying. Reminds me again of, um, what is that guy? Uh, the New York serial killer, Sam, Sam something, whatever his name is. Thinking of that guy. Um, it could be anybody and the victims could be anybody. We don't know what the motive is. We do believe that believe is that it's a mission oriented. Damn. That's what the chief police said. This person's on a mission. Chuck said, this is interesting choice of words that implies that the police may know more than they're letting on. That's implying that there's evidence to suggest this person may be going around serving some higher purpose. He says what the killer may think that purpose is. Chuck doesn't know. It's too soon to speculate. He says there is simply too little information. And so we know they released this grainy video footage. I know. Son of Sam. Thank you guys. Son of Sam. My nose is all stuff now. I mean, I don't know. This could, I mean, I hope they catch this guy soon. I, I'm really thinking like this guy could potentially have, unless he just started with this, these serial killings, he could have a long list of killings under his belt. And I, and I do agree that I think this guy's got to be local. Okay, so nonetheless, he's confident the shooter will be caught either through diligent police work, luck, or both. The ambiguity of cell phones, smart, smart doorbells, <laughs> oh my God, and security cameras will mean the soon, that sooner or later the clear image of the perpetrator will be captured, he says. Ambiguity, right? How do you say that? Ambiguity, something like that. <laughs> That's going to make it harder for this guy to keep going, Shug says. I don't think he can keep doing this in stock much longer and getting away with it. For more, the Stockton police say they're considering every possibility as they receive hundreds of tips every day. The police still don't know if it's just one or multiple, two or multiple suspects. Uh, the fact remains that the offender feels comfortable walking dangerous streets alone at odd hours because they are supremely confident in their own ability to react with an extreme level of violence. And I, I really wonder, too, how many times uh, these other victims were shot. This woman was shot 10 times that survived. It, does he do that with everybody that he shoots? All right. So now, oh, somebody's hold on. Somebody fixed it for me. How was it? Ubiquity. Thank you, Kristen. Ubiqui ubiquity. All right. I still gotta reach out to my friend. Uh, prayer partner, Eve. Hey, how you doing? Hope you're doing well. Says he probably believes that choice of time of someone is awake. They're addicts. So I wonder if he's going after them for those that struggle with drug use. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. It could be a thing because that's what the survivor, she said she was struggling with drugs for like 20 years or something, right? 
All right. So let me, we're going to see some of the, these are some of the stories that Silvio shared with me, just weird Stockton stories. And then we're also going to, I saw Tom, Tom, and I guess some other people were talking about this story that's kind of developing, I guess. Um, Excelsior Springs, if that's how you say it. Where's this at? Montana? I've never heard of this place before. This is something that I, I guess is developing. Uh, Springs man charged with our kidnapping victim stable. Oh, God. All right, so we're going to check that out in a second, too. Let's work through these weird stories here first. Uh, oh, Missouri. Oh, Missouri, okay. Uh Right now, Delta College police in Stockton are investigating a case of animal abuse. A dozen koi fish, worth thousands of dollars each, were beaten to death. KCR 3s Mike DeSalle joins us live from Stockton with more. And Walt, this was all caught on surveillance video. The police department here at the uh, San Joaquin Delta Community College releasing video in hopes that people will recognize the two people behind this. Now, what happened was about 11 o'clock last night, these two men, according to police, came onto campus armed with a spear in the left hand of that one gentleman and a knife in the other. And what they proceeded to do was go to the school's prize koi pond and spear, beat, and cut. 12 of these fish, 11 have already died because they were beaten so severely. One uh, is on the verge of death, according to the police department here. And the big concern here is police want to identify these two men because they say if they will resort to this kind of violence as quickly as they will uh, with these fish, then they will probably ratchet up and be even more violent in the future. They want to identify. And this was from 2010. He had sent me this. He sent me this yesterday. And, and I, and I kind of like, I didn't really look at them, and then this morning I looked at them like, oh, this is weird. I was like, all right, I'm going to share this with the stream. Fish killers caught on camera. And from what I can see, like, I was trying to look online for an update for this, because if they ever caught these people, I don't think they did. I, I couldn't find any update. Identify these two so they can get them into custody and ask them why they did this. In all, they say probably fifteen thousand dollars in damage to the koi fish that were beaten and mutilated here. But again, the bigger concern is that if they're going to resort to this kind of violence so nonchalantly on this campus, going to police, then they could be even more violent in the future. They want to make sure to nip this in the bud. So if anybody recognizes, so Shaniqua, hey, what's up? Thanks for stopping by. She Shaniqua says at least they're not killing people.